Hi, everybody. It's Congresswoman Laura Underwood. Thank you so much for joining us once again today for a Facebook Live Town Hall. I'm here today with Dr. Deanna Behrens. Dr. Behrens is a pediatric critical care physician and is a fellow with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Both Dr. Behrens and I will be taking your questions live today, so please leave them in the comment section on your screen. Now, over the past few days, we've been hearing cautious optimism from state, our state's public health leaders that we're beginning to flatten the curve here in Illinois. Uh, our work to stay home has begun to have a measurable impact, which is what we've all been striving for. It's welcome news, but we know that the sacrifices that each of you and your loved ones have been making um, by staying at home are having a really significant impact. So thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm working every day to ensure that the federal government response helps our community here in Northern Illinois. We need personal protective equipment for our healthcare providers and our essential workers. We need more robust testing so that everyone who needs a test can get one. We need affordable insurance coverage for COVID-19 testing and treatment so that families don't face high medical bills for getting sick. We need income supports like the unemployment insurance and the rebate checks. Many of you have already begun receiving this funding via direct deposit over the last week. But families with dependents over age 17, like college students and disabled adults, they didn't receive the funding for those members of their household. I think that's wrong. So I helped introduce to make sure that families receive funding for their adult dependents. Our small businesses need more funding and loans to keep their employees on payroll. And our essential services like schools and fire departments and first responders need funding to keep up with demand. The US Postal Service is also facing a shortfall during this trying time. And we need to make sure that they can continue to provide the essential delivery service that keeps us all connected. Now, I've also helped introduce legislation to save the Postal Service. We're fighting every day for these priorities and many more. So far, I've helped secure over $165.2 million in federal resources for our communities. $108 million to help childcare providers and help K-12 schools provide online learning. $12.2 million to help our neighbors experiencing homelessness or unaffordable housing and then $45 million for local colleges and universities to help displaced students pay for housing and food and other essentials. Now this week, Congress is likely to vote on additional funding for small business loans and grants, as well as more funding for COVID-19 testing in hospitals. I thought I was going to DC today. Doesn't look like that's happening, maybe tomorrow. We're all watching the news very closely to understand the timing of this upcoming vote. But I think that the key is, is that more relief is on the way. We're not even close to being done with our response effort. And we'll get right back to work on our next package of legislation as soon as we pass the bill this week. As I work on additional response legislation, I want to hear from you. What additional support do you need? My office is taking calls seven days a week. We're here for you, okay? So now I wanna turn it over to Dr. Behrens. Dr. Behrens, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hi all, my name is Dr. Deanna Behrens and I'm a pediatrician who works in the intensive care unit uh, in Chicago and the surrounding areas. So what that means is that I take care of some of the very sickest kids in these areas. And I wanna thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Underwood, both for inviting me here and for all of that amazing stuff that you've been doing that you've been talking about. The Postal Service hits close to home for me because my grandpa was a postal carrier. I also wanna thank the American Academy of Pediatrics for helping me be part of this today. Yes, and then I wanna thank all of you guys because as Congresswoman Underwood said, Everything that you guys have been doing is all so important and all of the right things to do. So staying home, washing your hands, practicing social distancing, that's the best tool that we have right now to fight this disease. We talk a lot about social distancing, but what exactly does that mean for you and your family and why do we do it? You might've noticed that I'm here at home. So tonight I'm gonna to be at the hospital taking care of sick kids, but until then our hospital asked us to stay home unless we're taking care of essential services. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing the same thing that you guys are. We are all at the forefront. So we have to be strict about social distancing. 
right now, as I said, there's no cure. There's no vaccine for COVID-19. That's right. The best thing that we can do is to prevent spreading infection and to prevent exposure. You might have heard in the news that COVID-19 primarily affects older people or people with pre-existing medical conditions, but unfortunately that's not always true. Kids can get infected with COVID-19 and thankfully the vast majority of them do well. They tend to do better than adults actually, but they can still spread disease. And then a very small minority of kids might get sick enough to end up in the hospital from COVID-19 and a very, very small percentage of those might end up needing my services in the pediatric ICU. So we wanna do everything that we can to prevent that. But we know that this is really hard. This time of year, weather's getting nice. Uh, it would be time for play dates and sporting events and proms and graduations. And we can't do that the same way that we're normally used to doing it. So it's important to talk to kids in an age appropriate language and especially to teens about why they're doing what they're doing, how important it is to validate their feelings, to find a way to recognize and celebrate special events for them like graduation and try to give them as much of a sense of normalcy as possible. The last thing I wanted to talk about before we go to some questions is that I know that everybody's trying to stay safe and healthy right now. And a lot of that involves cleaning and sanitizing things. And that's really important. We want you to continue to do that. But we in the medical community have noticed that there's been an increase in the number of accidental ingestions in kids and even in some adults. So it's really important that after you finish cleaning that you put stuff away and make sure that it's not accessible to kids or an eye line of kids. So as a pediatrician, one of the most important things that I can do for you guys and for the community right now is to give you accurate information and to help you find where to get accurate information. So for that, I highly recommend looking up the AAP, the CDC, and the healthychildren.org website. There's a ton of resources available on there as well, as well as our local IDPH and um, other health organizations in the state. This is a scary and difficult time, but please know that your pediatrician is here to help you through it all. Thank you for attending today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, Dr. Barron. So we had some questions that were submitted in advance. So I'm gonna go ahead and start asking some of those. And then we're inviting people who are watching all of our friends on Facebook Live to leave a question in the comments. And once I finish my questions, we'll turn it over to the live questions. Sound good? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so what's the impact on COVID, of COVID on children? Since it seems like it might be less severe physically, but what about their mental health? Yeah, so first of all, I wanna address that. So kids can get sick. So one thing I wanna say, and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later too, is that if you think your kid is sick, please don't hesitate to seek medical attention for them because they can get sick from this. But in general, we are worried about how this is gonna affect their mental and emotional health too. So one thing that you guys can do, we already talked about is to give honest age appropriate information to them in a way that they're gonna understand. So they don't necessarily need all of the scary statistics, but they do need to know that this is something that they're doing that's important, that can help everyone. And that helps give them a feeling of belonging and that they're doing something that's valuable to the community. Um, also, we want them to have a sense of some kind of control and a little bit of normalcy. So it's really important to get a good night's sleep, for example, to get physical exercise, to get um, a schedule for them as much as possible at home. And we know that that's not going to be the same schedule that they're going to do as they would be at school, but having some kind of schedule that works for your family is going to help kids cope with all of this. Uh, you want to validate and reinforce what they're going through. So letting them know that this is hard, it's hard for you, it's hard for everybody, but that it, it's going to help save people and it's going to help save lives, something that you can do to talk to them about. And then you do want to watch though for signs um, that they aren't coping well. So even if you're doing all of this stuff, it's still hard to be cooped up inside. It wears on people after a while. So signs that you can watch for would be irritability, changes in weight or sleep pattern, um, the kids being anxious or withdrawn. And so if you see something like that, please go ahead and call your pediatrician's office. They can schedule some mental and social health screening forms and help you guys figure out how to help the kids at this time. I'd also like to say, please, please, please lock up anything or keep everything in a safe space that could be used 
either accidentally or intentionally um, for harm for kids in these age groups. So for instance, if you have a gun, it's important to lock it up separately with a safe storage method um, and keep your ammunition separate. If you have medications, keep them in a medicine cabinet. We already talked about uh, keeping your cleaning supplies in a space that kids can't easily get to. And then finally, take care of yourself. So kids can recognize when you're stressed and when you're tired too. So you need to make sure that you're getting sleep and rest and good, healthy meals and exercise just like the kids are. Those are such wonderful tips uh, for all of us, even if your kids are older, right? So many of these things apply uh, because people are experiencing uh, the physical distancing, social distancing and the changes to day-to-day -day life. Uh, and coping in different ways. And so it's really important to check in with everybody in our lives to make sure that they're doing all right. Absolutely. Uh, so what should parents be doing with their existing pediatrician appointments for their kids? That is a great question because we hear a lot that we're trying to keep everybody home and we want everybody to um, stay at home as much as possible. So some parents worry that that would extend to their well child visits. So the truth is we don't know how long this is gonna be going on. Uh, like you said, the curve seems to be flattening a little bit and that's really great and good news, but it still might be a while and we don't want kids to get behind on things. So we want them to see their pediatrician on their normal well child visit. Now, sometimes that might be in person, it might be over the phone or over a video interview, but it's really important because we want them to get all of the immunizations that they need, we want to make sure that they're growing appropriately, that they're gaining weight, that they're meeting their developmental milestones. And then again, particularly for immunizations, because the last thing that we want in the middle of this pandemic Absolutely. to have an outbreak of measles or chicken pox or whooping cough or some other preventable illness. And finally, um, we have talked a lot about, you might hear, call your doctor, call your doctor, do all this stuff. And that is important. But if you are worried that your kid is sick, please don't hesitate to call your doctor. Or if they're really sick, call 911 and have them go to the ED or the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Because what we're worried about sometimes is that um, parents are keeping kids at home and not seeking medical attention as much as they would. And they're doing that out of love and a sense of caution because we've been saying that we want to keep kids home, but we don't want the kids to get too sick. So if they have a high fever for a long time, if they're not eating or drinking, if they look like they're getting dehydrated, if they're not waking up like they're supposed to, all of those sorts of things and other things that make you worried, please call your pediatrician and they can help direct you from there. Awesome. Now, what about the masks? How do we navigate wearing masks with families and with our children and what's the protocol? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's one that my friends and family ask me a lot too. And so first I wanna say thank you guys so much to everybody who's been making masks and volunteering and donating things to hospitals and to your friends and your family and your neighborhood. That's really important and valuable. Um, one thing though is that masks do offer a little bit of protection to you guys but it mostly is to protect other people from people who are sick because we know that there are people who have the virus who are showing fewer no symptoms. And it's really only important though to wear masks if you're out and about in the public. So if you're going to grocery stores, if you're, you know, have to go to work for whatever reason. So we want you guys to be careful there. So for the most part, what we recommend is keeping kids home as much as possible. That doesn't mean that they have to physically necessarily be inside. They can be outside playing, they can go for walks. Um, if they're going for walks or they're in the park and you, they're able to be six feet away from people, then they don't have to have a mask. If you do need a mask for kids though, there are some things that we recommend. One, we don't recommend masks for kids under two. We don't recommend masks for any kids who have, um, kind of underlying diseases that might make it hard for them to take the masks off. We don't recommend masks for anybody who has breathing problems through the masks because sometimes kids can have a hard time breathing that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to practice with them a little bit. Show them that you're wearing your mask, tell them why, get them a mask that they like. Um, practice not touching their hands or their face because that's exactly where we don't want them to be touching. And then practice washing your hands for 20 seconds with warm soapy water, both before and after taking off the mask. And then actually wash your mask with um, either detergent or in your washing machine with hot water, as hot as it could be, every time you come in and out. So you might wanna have a couple of masks if you're able. And then the thing with the mask too, I've been watching people's mask etiquette is <laughs> yes. we gotta take it off the right way. Because right? you don't wanna cross contaminate 
that almost defeats the purpose of wearing the mask. Totally. Yeah. So you want to make sure that they don't touch the, this part of their face, that they That's take right. it off without touching the outsides. And then um, I know that people wear masks and gloves and stuff to grocery stores. So please dispose of those in a respectable manner to respectful manner, I should say. You don't want to leave all of those dirty things laying around in your cart or something for the grocery workers or the retail workers, because there are people who are at high risk too. They're at the front line of this. Thank you. So as, as families navigate this pandemic, what does it mean for screen time? I know all of us are spending a lot more time than we ever thought doing things like this, uh, video chat, um, the e-learning is a lot more screen time for kids. So what are you guys advising? Yeah, so as you guys probably have heard, uh, the AAP does have a lot of recommendations about screen times, but even the Academy recognizes that this is unusual and trying times and this is extraordinary times. So there are actually really good ways that you can utilize screen time and social media. So some of that will be relaxed. So you can use that to stay connected with people. Uh, my sister is a special ed teacher and I have a four-year-old nephew. So when she needs to make calls with her students, sometimes he'll call me so that I can kind of babysit him while uh, she's doing her work. So that's a good way to stay connected. And also it's important for teenagers to feel like they can stay connected with their friends. So we do recommend loosening some of that screen time a little bit. The most important thing though, is to monitor what they're watching. We want them to have good social media exposure, um, good screen time exposure. So know what they're watching. There's a couple of organizations that can help find trusted sources like Common Sense Media. And then there's some great things like PBS Kids, um, the Chicago Public Library and a lot of other libraries in the neighborhood do daily, uh, daily stories at 10 a.m., mm -hmm. which is really cool, I've kind of, watch those a little bit. And then as far as school, so communicate with your teacher, your teacher should communicate with you guys what they expect for both online and offline learning. So it's not gonna be the same as they are at school. We're not expecting them to be on the computer for eight hours a day, listening to lectures. It's gonna be a different mix of things. So yeah. get a plan with your teachers about what they're expecting from you guys. And then finally, like build in some downtime during the day. So we don't want kids to be cooped up and we don't want anybody really to be cooped up and doing the same thing for the entire yeah. stretch of time that they would. So it's okay for kids to have little breaks, um, to have some downtime, to have a little Zoom dance party with their grandparents <laughs> or whatever they might want to do. Um, I do scavenger hunts with my nieces every now, oh, cute. every now and then, and I'll just tell her, go find something pink or a circle or something, and she'll bring it back. And that helps her figure out colors and shapes yeah. and that sort of stuff. So. Those are such great ideas. Um, now, what about advice for expectant moms? How are hospitals advising and what are you seeing around our community? Yeah, first I wanna say congratulations. It's still a really exciting time if you're pregnant. So we don't wanna take that away from you. Uh, a lot of it is doing what we're recommending everybody be doing. So a lot of social distancing, hand washing, that it's all important, but especially so for pregnant moms because we know that viruses can affect pregnant women in mm -hmm. a kind of a more exaggerated way sometimes. So a lot of the questions that my friends and family have been asking me is um, who's gonna get to be in the hospital? So yeah. unfortunately, because of everything going on, we do want to limit the number of people in the hospital with the expectant mom. So typically it's gonna be limited to just one person. And sometimes if there's a doula or midwife that the mom has been working with, they'll be allowed in as well. Right now, it doesn't look like the virus is transmitted from the mom to the baby during pregnancy, although we're learning new things every day. Right. But when the baby is born, there is still a risk that the baby could get the virus, even at a very, very young age. So a couple of things for that. One, we know it's exciting to have a new baby and that you want to introduce the baby to everybody and have everybody come over and love on the baby. But we really recommend strict social distancing, even with a new baby. And that's hard. Um, I'm really glad that we do have some of these things like the video chats and all this so that yep. we can introduce the baby to other people in a really safe way. If there is somebody who comes over, first of all, nobody who is sick, cough, cold, runny nose, fever should be allowed around the baby. Um, anybody who does see the baby should wash their hands before and after. Although again, we recommend limiting people as much as possible. 
And then the other question I get asked a lot about is breastfeeding. So we do recommend to continue to breastfeed even for moms who are not feeling so great. And that's because um, even though we don't know for sure if the virus can be passed through right. the breast milk, we haven't seen that yet, but we're still learning since it's a new virus. Even though we don't know for sure, if the mom has been exposed to the virus, she should produce those antibodies, which uh, help fight the infection. And then she can pass them on to baby, the baby through the breast milk. If she is sick and she's wanting to breastfeed, we do recommend that she wear a mask while breastfeeding and wash her hands, of course, before and after. If she's pumping, uh, the CDC actually has really good guidelines about how to clean the breast pump, but essentially it's cleaning it really well in good soapy water, warm soapy water, any part that would have touched the um, any of the milk. And then if there is somebody else who is well, we would recommend feeding the baby the express bre breast milk if the mom chooses to pump. Oh, excellent. And then obviously the expectant mom should also take a look at cdc.gov. Excellent advice. Absolutely. Um, in addition to all the great things that Dr. Barron's recommends. So last question that we had submitted in advance. Do you think that this is gonna come back in the fall? And what are you, what are, if you had a crystal ball and based on your wealth of medical expertise, what do you think? You know what, that is a great question. And if I had the answer to that, I would be winning Nobel prizes and <laughs> doing all of that stuff. But the truth is we don't know. Yeah. Uh, we are worried though. We are worried that if social distancing is relaxed too early, that it could come back and it could be even worse than it is now. Right. We are worried that the, there could be a second wave even with um, doing it in all the right ways. So the truth is this could last for a while. Uh, we want to always be honest with you as healthcare providers, so it could last for a while. We might have to do a couple of rounds of social distancing, but as Congresswoman Underwood said, the good news is that it is working. Um, we are seeing fewer cases than we have expected. So in addition to working in the pediatric ICU, they've asked me to help work in the adult ICU as well because I have some medical training um, for adults too. Mm -hmm. So I'm volunteering at some of the other hospitals in the community on the adult side. And while they're being harder hit than they would like to be, it's not as bad as it could be. So we've really done a great job here in Illinois. And I really think, you know, um, Governor Pritzker and Mayor um, Lightfoot and people like you who have helped with that. Well, thank you for our, your leadership and your incredible contributions and for sharing all this information with us today. So we've been asking people on Facebook to go ahead and submit some questions in the comments. We've gotten quite a few comments. So I'm gonna start at the top and some of these might be better for the second portion when sure. it's just me. So we might um, put a pause on some of these questions just for our viewers who you know, may be like, well, what happened to my question? Mm -hmm. um, so there's one about loan forgiveness. So that'll be later. Not something I know um, about. Yes. Um, somebody who's gotten yelled at about masks. Oh, say, here we go. Oh, yes. Well, I was just going to say, as far as that, uh, I want everybody to recognize that this is a really difficult time for people. So um, there might be people who choose not to wear a mask for whatever reason. So I don't want people to feel like just because we're recommending that, that we should be shaming others for what choices that they're making, even if it's not something that we would choose for ourselves. Awesome. Here's a question from Trish. I would like to get a better understanding of how infectious packaging is from things I buy at the grocery store or other places. Do I really need to wipe everything down with a bleach solution? That's a really great question. And as I said, we're still learning a lot about this. So there's been some studies that look at how long the virus sticks around. And on it seems to stick around a little bit longer on some of the plastic stuff than on the cardboard. Now that doesn't mean though that the virus is gonna be as infective as if somebody like sneezed in your face, but it would be, probably be best practice to wipe stuff down when you get it home. So what I personally do, so when I go to the store, I wear my mask, I wear gloves, and also I wanna be extra cautious because I am a healthcare provider and I am at risk. So I wanna not infect anybody else. Yeah. But when I bring stuff home, I will, if it's something like 
we like the bubbly water. So I'll leave those packages in the cardboard and I'll leave those in my garage for a day or two. Um, if it's something that I need to bring inside, I will wash it down with either a bleach solution or some Clorox wipes. And I'll wash my hands before and after. And I'll also wash the surface that it's on. So this is again, something that we're not 100% sure about, but in my opinion, it's the safest thing to do for right now. But of awesome. course, um, as I said, we are worried about contamination and accidental mm. ingestion. So if you are wiping down food, of course you don't want really to be wiping down, you know, apples that you might be eating with bleach and Clorox, but uh, you want to do stuff in a safe and reasonable way. Excellent. Now there's a question from Michelle. When will testing for immunity to COVID-19 be available to our constituents? That is Have a great seen, question. Yeah, yeah. The antibody tests. The antibody test. So we mentioned the antibodies a little bit earlier in conjunction with breastfeeding. And so that's something that your body naturally produces in response to a virus. So the FDA approved three kinds of testing, I believe, for the antibodies. I don't know the timing for it in Illinois, first I'm going to say, because the last that I looked on the IDPH website, they didn't have that information available. A couple of things, though, about the antibody testing. So one, Antibodies show up if you've been exposed to the virus. And usually that's between two to six weeks later because your body has had to have a chance to fight that or to build that response. Right. So the thinking is that if you have antibodies, you've likely been exposed and you will likely be immune. So there's a couple of things I want to caution people about. One, no test is perfect. So keep that in mind. Two, um, there are other strains of coronavirus that aren't this one that's making people so sick. So we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a way that we're testing specifically for this one. And then three, uh, even if you have the antibodies, we don't know because it's such a new disease, how long that's gonna convey um, protection. So mm -hmm. I would still recommend all of the same stuff that we're doing. What we think it might be useful for, or what we're hoping it might be useful for, eventually widespread to test people. And I think that'll be great. But testing healthcare providers, um, first line workers, people who might be able to, who have been infected, who can go back out and maybe be a little bit more safe taking care of other people. For instance, one of my friends at Hopkins, Dr. Sapna Kuchadkar, so she got COVID-19 and she was sick for about two weeks. Um, and now she's out and she's helping the adult side, just like I am. And she's actually donating some of her convalescent plasma, wow. which means that donating, um, or she's trying to donate that. It means donating stuff from people who've already been exposed to the disease to give people who are sick with the disease, those antibodies. So we wouldn't do that for like, I don't have it right now, or I don't have any symptoms of it right now. So she wouldn't be donating to me, but if somebody is really sick and in the hospital, that's a therapy that we're trying. I awesome. wish I had a timeline though, as far as when that would be widespread and available. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Jeff. Can I do social distance driveway visits with my grandkids with all of us outside? They are four and five. They run around and I watch and talk with them, but no contact. What do you think? Yeah, you know, um, I think it's really hard sometimes with four and five year olds not to wanna like come hug grandkids and grandma and grandpa. But if you can have them come over and play around in the yard and you feel like you can keep a safe distance from them, then I think that's a great way to, um, to keep in contact with people. But again, it is gonna be really difficult for grandkids and for grandparents not to have yeah. any contact. So I wanna keep that in mind. You have to really know that the kids can understand why they can see you guys, but not interact with you and why they have to stay you know, several arm distances away, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Sure. Um, okay, I, I know you probably have to go. And so my last question that I'm gonna pick is from Renee. Any tips of what to look for in community centers or summer day camps? Should they reopen for best practices? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Do you mean- um, So if, if, like if and when you know, oh, our economy okay. reopens and oh, people well, are I making see. decisions for the summer for their kids, I, any best practices and how parents should evaluate those summer activities? Yeah, um, so I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows exactly how that's gonna roll out and how that's gonna happen right now. But I would look for how they responded during the shutdown and during the quarantine. I would ask them what their practices were, how they kept people safe, um, what kinds of 
equipment do they have? What kind of monitoring do they have for people who might get sick? What kind of policies do they have in place if there's a child who's sick, if there's a staff member who got sick, things like that. So hopefully we will be able to resume some of these kinds of activities over the summer in a graduated and safe response. Yeah. So hopefully keep well, on our fingers crossed. That's right. Dr. Barron, thank you so much for all you do in our community for taking a few minutes to come and share some pieces of advice and really just some really approachable explanations with all of us this afternoon. We're so grateful uh, for you and for the American Academy of Pediatrics and um, come back anytime. We'd love to, to catch up again. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And again, you're doing so much and I'm so proud of all that Illinois is doing to help fight this virus. Thank you. Thank you.